Welcome aboard, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Peter Glidden here, your steadfast advocate for health. Uh, a number of years ago, I was at a health freedom convention in Schaumburg, Illinois, and there were a couple of guys there uh, recording um, interviews with holistic doctors. They recorded an interview with me where I waxed, uh, uh, I waxed on, <laughs> not waxed off, about chemotherapy. And currently, it's, this has gotten a lot of legs, this video, 40 million views now. That's a goodly number, 40 million views on Facebook. And it's generating a lot of buzz, a lot of interest and a lot of questions. And it was a short little thing. So the intention here tonight, and this is a live recording, by the way, this is a live event that, that we're recording, and then we're going to post it on Facebook and YouTube, is to bring this whole conversation about cancer into the um, foreground. Because there's a lot of information that you just don't know about it that most people are completely unaware of, and it's killing you. It's killing us collectively. So it is my intention here tonight to do a little bit more of an in-depth look into the cancer treatment phenomena, phenomenon <clears throat> in the United States. So thank you so much for your time. Let's jump into the deep end of the pool. Uh, this is what started it all. This was a research paper that was published in 2004. The Contribution of Cytotoxic Chemotherapy to Five-Year Survival in Adult Malignancies. We're going to touch on this more at the very end, but the simple fact of the matter is that the research shows chemotherapy is virtually ineffective for the treatment of cancer, but because the chemotherapy in the cancer treatment industry is so huge and is such a gigantic moneymaker that the statistics have been not manipulated, but they have been presented to you in such a way as to be misleading. And like the fella said, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. So let's see if we can't pull the curtain back here and try to get a grasp of what's really happening. Now, for those of you who are new to this venue, I am a naturopathic physician. The initials after my name are N.D. Uh, I graduated from Bastyr University in 1991. That's in Kenmore, Washington. I've been a member of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, I believe, since 1989. And in order to become a naturopathic doctor in the United States, a licensed naturopathic doctor in the United States. You have to do four years of pre-med. Uh, I did that at the University of Massachusetts. Four years of naturopathic medical school. Currently, there are seven, I believe, accredited naturopathic medical schools in North America. During your education, you have to secure about 900 hours of clinical supervision. Then you have to graduate. <laughs> then pass state boards, and then pass national boards, and then pursue continuing education credit every year once you have been licensed in a state that licenses naturopathic medicine. Currently, there are only 20 states in the United States that license and regulate naturopathic medicine. Apparently, the laws of science or nature change when you cross a state line. Now, this gentleman... Dr. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, he put his life, his liberty, and his family fortune on the line so that the United States could be born. Here's what he had to say over 200 years ago, and he would be spinning in his grave if he saw what was happening now. Unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize itself into a dictatorship to restrict the art of healing to one class of men and deny equal privileges to others will constitute the Bastille of medical science. All such laws are un-American and despotic. And ladies and gentlemen, regretfully, that is exactly what has happened here. If you'd like a more in-depth analysis of the evolution of medicine in the United States, you can get a copy of my book, The MD Emperor Has No Clothes, or watch a number of videos that are available on my 
website. Nonetheless, let me put it into a little bit more perspective here. Medicine is like dogs. You know, there's a lot of different types of dogs, and they're all good for different things. There's bloodhounds. They're good for finding lost people in the wilderness. There's Labrador retrievers. They're good for duck hunting, good for pheasant hunting, good for goose hunting. There's chihuahuas. I have no idea what they're good for. But I can guarantee you, if you take a chihuahua duck hunting, you're going to come back empty-handed. Wrong dog for the hunt. It's the same with medicine. We need the right type of medicine for the right health condition. And regretfully, we don't have those choices because of the lack of a free medical market. Now, your medical doctor, it may interest you to know, is not trained in medicine. Nobody is. Medicine is a big umbrella. It's a vast domain under which there are many different types of medicine, and they're all good for different things. There's acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, chiropractic, homeopathic, naturopathic, right? Ayurvedic, the oldest system of medicine on the planet. Well, interestingly enough, your medical doctor is trained in one small piece of the pie of medical science. It's referred to as allopathic medicine. So again, this you, you must understand this. Your medical doctor may be the nicest person that God ever created, but they don't practice medicine. They practice allopathic medicine. They're not trained in medicine. They're trained in allopathic medicine. And in order for you to understand their treatment strategies, you have to get a, a minimal grasp of what this means. You wouldn't go to a chiropractor if you had a bullet in your arm. He heaven forbid, right? Wrong dog for that hunt. Because you know that that's not what the chiropractors do. Well, you don't know what the medical doctors are good at, and you don't know what they're bad at because of the medical monopoly that's existed for over 100 years. So MDs practicing allopathic medicine are trained in a philosophy of science, a philosophy of medicine called reductionism. And this is a very important distinction for you to understand. So important that I'm going to bring it full screen here, okay? Now, a person's philosophy informs what they do. And this isn't just in the wonderful world of science, right? It's for everything. It's for politics and economics and religion. A person's philosophy informs what they do. So we need to have a grasp of what the philosophy that informs the MDs is and juxtapose that against other types of medicine. So... Reductionism argues that the human body is a machine. There is no soul because according to reductionism, if it can't be measured, it does not exist. Since nobody's dissected the soul out of the human body, it doesn't exist. There is no consciousness or consciousness itself to the reductionist is a function of biochemistry. The body does not have a very good ability to heal itself and therefore illnesses must be managed with drugs. And by the way, each broken piece of the body machine gets its own medicine, right? So you get one medicine for your heartburn, one medicine for your blood pressure, one medicine for your arthritis, one medicine for your headache, one medicine for your insomnia, one medicine for your anxiety, one medicine for your blood sugar, and two or three medicines to take care of the side effects of all those medicines. Did you ever wonder why that you were given so many medicines? It's n not really to make the pharmaceutical industry rich, although that is a side effect. It's because of reductionism, because reductionism looks at the body like it is a machine, and each piece of the body gets its own medicine. Now, contrary to this, by the way, every type of medicine in the world, everything except what the MDs are trained in, is holistic. And there's a lot of understanding, misunderstanding about holistic medicine. The 
biggest misunderstanding is how it's spelled. It's spelled with a W. If it's you don't leave the W off because if you do it, it's incorrect. Holism is about the whole. It's a philosophy that everything is connected. The body is an integrated, intimate system of interrelated parts, that there is, in fact, a soul which is driving the entire thing forward. Your body has intelligence, which is brought to the show by the presence of the spirit inside the human body. Your body is so smart, it grew itself all by itself from a single cell into you, and it's also managing millions of biochemical processes right now without your conscious control. Your body has wisdom. Medical doctors do not believe this. Every holistic branch of medicine does. The chiropractors believe this. The naturopaths, the homeopaths, acupuncturists, traditional Chinese medical doctors, Ayurvedic practitioners, herbalists, everybody but the MDs. And a very important distinction is that holistic medicine attempts to cure the condition. Holistic medicine attempts to cure the condition. Reductionistic allopathic medicine attempts to manage the condition of the thousands of prescription medicines that are currently available. For goodness sakes, the only ones that cure anything are antibiotics, and those are starting to fail us. Your medical doctor doesn't even know how to cure heartburn, right? And inquiring minds would like to know that why have we given about a trillion dollars of money for research for cancer to the profession that doesn't even know how to cure heartburn. Well, again, it's because of the medical monopoly. Uh, the fundamental naturopathic <coughs> uh, supposition is that the human body knows how to fix itself, the human body wants to fix itself, and it's the job of the holistic doctor to deliver therapeutics to the body which support and promote that, which support the body's built-in God-given ability to fix itself. That is what we do. That is my job description. Now, this is not a bash the MD session. This is a, you know, let's get the proper perspective. The wheelhouse of the medical doctor, because they are reductionistic, is trauma care and surgery when it's necessary. Also, they're pretty okay at a handful of infectious diseases, but again, antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections are the next epidemic, and it was caused by the MD's reductionistic treatment of infectious disease. But look, if you have a bullet in your arm, again, heaven forbid, don't go to the nature path, go to the emergency room, because that's what the MDs are good at. And the stuff they can do with surgery is remarkable. Military field surgeons, remarkable. But you know, right, when everything, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So sometimes, even though surgery might not be your best option, because it's the only thing that the surgeon knows, that's what they're going to recommend. And because we don't have a free medical market, you can't get a second opinion easily. You're probably going to go for the unnecessary surgery. But this is where the MDs are good. This is their strengths. And, you know, we've come a long, long way, even in the last 50 years in the surgical theater. And we really need to take our hats off to the MDs because they're exceptional at that. Now, <clears throat> there are some interesting statistics that you need to be aware of. Medical MD-directed treatments for chronic diseases are not intended to cure. They don't, they're not intended to cure things. The only things that cure anything are antibiotics. They're also the leading cause of bankruptcy in the United States, and it's not because people don't have enough medical insurance, it's because the treatments are super expensive, and why are they super expensive? Well, what's the most expensive medicine? It's the one that doesn't cure anything. And this is the million pound, billion pound, trillion pound gorilla sitting on planet Earth that nobody's aware of. And interestingly enough, MD-directed medical therapeutics in the United States are the leading cause of death. About 760,000 people more or less die because they went to a medical doctor. Medical doctors kill. I'm not saying they do it on purpose, but as a result of their treatments, they kill more people than cancer and more people than heart disease. For goodness sakes, we all need to collectively snap out of it and wake up. You know, I mean, from an objective perspective, 
No, knowing what I do, I have 28 years of clinical experience as a licensed naturopathic doctor. You wouldn't believe the things I've seen people recover from. MD treatments, allopathic, reductionistic, pharmaceutical centrist treatments for chronic diseases are the wrong dog for the hunt. They're the wrong dog for the hunt. Benjamin Rush was right. If you don't have a free medical market, then a monopoly will develop. And inside of a monopoly, you can have treatment failures. You can have exorbitant high costs. You can do whatever you want because there's no consequences when you screw up. It's good to be the king. This is the reason that we're in such a pickle here, not only in the United States, but all around the world. And it's not just cancer. But, you know, that's what we're here to talk about tonight, cancer. So... Fasten your seatbelt, put something heavy on your head, because it's about to explode. Let's take a look. Cancer by the numbers. Now these, you know, I'm drawing these statistics from not naturopathic journals, but conventional journals. American Cancer Society, the United States Center for Disease Control, etc. Here we go. Projected new cancer cases by 2020, it, the projections are 1.9 million new cancer cases. In 2016 in the U.S., there were an estimated 1,685,210 new cancer cases, and about 600,000 people died from cancer. That's approximately 4,620 new cases every day and 1,630 deaths every day. But if you listen to the way that the cancer treatment people portray cancer treatment, it seems to you like we're doing really, really great. Again, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Statistical shenanigans. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Now, this is... Um, information again this data these data are from the National Cancer Institute the department called surveillance surveillance epidemiology and end results program the acronym for that is SEER here's what they have to say first of all the American Cancer Society years ago stopped talking about curing cancer and started talking about five-year survivorship most people aren't aware of this but what that means is if you have cancer and you go for conventional treatment and you die five years and one day after you started treatment, that goes into the books as a successful treatment, even though you died from cancer. That's one way that they have manipulated the data. Here's two other ways. So you go to the CDC website. And how many people survive five years or more after being diagnosed with female breast cancer? Holy smokes, almost 90%. Almost 90% of women are still alive. That is an unbelievably, remarkably positive thing. 90% survival rate after five years. Oh, my God. Where do I donate? I want to give these people more money, right? That's how you think. But, but the devil is in the details. This is relative survival. Relative survival. What does relative survival mean? This means they take the number of people who have breast cancer, in this case, women with breast cancer, and how many of those women died with breast cancer, and then they compare that to how many women of the same age died from other things. So, you know, if, if you're 65 and a lot of women die at 65 from heart disease, and you die at 65 from breast cancer that waters the results down. This is what relative cancer survival rates mean. What we need to talk about is absolute cancer survival statistics. And those are very, very difficult to find. I spent hours trying to find absolute cancer survival statistics. It's very difficult to do. Because everybody that treats cancer talks about relative survival, but the average Joe on the street has no idea what that means. It's not how many people survived from cancer who had breast cancer. It's a relative 
they, everybody gets put into the same pool and, well, you know, you're a woman and you're 65 and you would have died anyway, so whatever. Died from breast cancer, tough. This is what relative survival means and, and it should be outlawed, quite frankly. It's misleading to the general public. Interestingly enough, the survive, this is, I'm not making this up, right? I mean, I couldn't make this up. It's heartbreaking. This is directly pulled off of the National Cancer Institute website, all of this, all right? The five-year survival rate, I quote, the percentage of people in a study or treatment group who are alive five years after they were diagnosed with or treated for a disease such as cancer. Whether or not the, de the disease came back. Still alive. Cancer goes away from the surgery, from the chemo, from the radiation, uh, and then it comes back. Yep, it's still successful. Five-year survivorship. Let's have a party. Most people don't understand this. It is statistical shenanigans, and it should be outlawed because it is patently misleading. Now, let's take a look at some real numbers. Breast cancer. Let's compare 1975 to 2014. 1975, there were 216 million people in the U.S., 2014, 318, 9, 319, so the population went up about 100 million. People with breast cancer in 1975, 226,966, let's say 227,000 people. People with breast cancer in 2014 doubled that, right, 422,000 more or less. So the population grew 100 million and, there, the, and the number of breast cancer cases doubled. Deaths from breast cancer in 1975 were 68,000, more or less. Deaths from breast cancer in 2014, 188,812 people. Now, how do these statistics compare with this? What do you mean there's an 89.7 survivorship rate for breast cancer? What are you talking about? 188, 189,000 women died in 2014 from breast cancer. Well, that's actually how many women died. That isn't a relative breast cancer survivorship, which is what they always talk about to mislead you. Well, you don't believe me? Well, let's take a look at some more numbers. This is... Estimated numbers of U.S. cancer survivors as of January 1st, 2014, all types of cancer. You want to pay attention to the blue bars where it says percent, right? So years since diagnosis. So within five years of diagnosis of cancer, any type of cancer, this is the average of all cancers combined. Within five years, 36% will have survived, which means 64% died. 64% of cancer patients died. 64% died. Only 36% survived. What's this 89% number? Well, that's just breast cancer, and it was a relative thing, not absolute. Between 5 and 10 years, 24% survived. That means, what, 76% died. 10 to 15 years, only 16% survived. You can read. You can read, this is the real deal. If you get cancer, you are probably going to die from cancer. But then they put you in a pool with other people your same age, and because everybody's health in this country is so crappy, everybody dies way too young, and so the survivorship seems to be increased. Oh, because all your friends are dying in their 60s. You died of cancer in your 60s. They died of heart disease in their 60s. They lumped all that together, and that's the relative survivorship of people with cancer. Whoa, isn't that great? Well, it's a lie. Well, it's a dodge is what it is. It's an academic dodge. But, again, there's lies, there's damn lies, and statistics. Thank goodness for Dr. Glidden. Let's take a look at 
some numbers. I pulled these directly off of the Cancer Treatment Centers of America's website. Small cell lung cancer survival rate, after five years, only 4% of people are alive. That means 96% are dead. Ovarian cancer survival rate, <clears throat> after five years, 33% are alive. That means 67% dead. Pancreatic cancer survivor rate, 98% dead after five years or, you know, within five years, by the fifth year. Prostate cancer, 69% dead. Rectal cancer, 81% dead. Stomach cancer, 98% dead. Need I go on? Colon cancer, five-year survivorship, 7%, 93% dead. Throat cancer, after five years, you're dead. Nobody survives throat cancer. Non-small cell lung cancer survivorship, 96% dead. Kidney cancer, 92% dead. Now, these are the numbers that are generated by the government and the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. These are not naturopathic numbers that we're pulling out of thin air. So why on earth would anybody sign up for a cancer treatment which is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars but is going to 97% of the time you're going to be dead? It's because it's sold to the cancer patients in ways which are not on the up and up. Now, you even don't need to know statistics because it's, statistics are complicated. They are. As you have seen from this little, little overview, I mean, it's a lot more sophisticated and complicated than this. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So just ask yourself the simple question. How many people do you personally know, not celebrities or, you know, people you've read about in the newspapers, how many people in your life People in your family, people in your church, people in your town, you know, people that you know got cancer. <clears throat> How many are still alive? Has it been more than five years? And if they are still alive, or if they're not still alive, or whatever, if they're still alive and they're doing conventional cancer treatment, what's the quality of their lives like? Did their hair fall out? Did their teeth fall out? Do they need to wear a diaper now? Do they need antidepressant medications? Do they need medications to wake up and medications to fall asleep and medications to soften their stool? And is their quality of their life the same? Is their personality the same? How, how's the ineffective cancer treatment that's unbelievably expensive going for them? How is it? Just ask that question. Forget the statistics. Just do a little in house survey. Oh, they fought cancer valiantly. Well, they took the wrong dog to the hunt. And meanwhile, Big Pharma got rich. Now look, let me just make one thing very clear here. I'm a naturopathic doctor and I am an advocate of holistic therapeutics, but I can also prescribe drugs work in hospitals in certain states, and it's covered by insurance. I'm not against drugs. Every time I go to the dentist, thank God for Novocaine. Thank you. Love that stuff. It's not the drug, it's how it's used. If chemotherapy was effective, I would be championing it. It does not work. And the numbers are right in front of everybody's face, but they are spun in such a way to confuse you, right? We see advertisements on TV all the time. I call it compassionate subterfuge. Human beings are nice people, kind people. The vast majority, we're not serial killers like Hollywood wants us to believe, murderers like Hollywood, all the TV shows, right? Murders and rapes and serial killers and oh my God, and bad people. Well, whatever. Sons of anarchy. Small percentage of the population. Most human beings are generous, kind. And, you know, accepting. Quite frankly, a little naive. 
So my supposition here is that you've been played. You know, you see advertisements of little kids with no hair because of their cancer treatment. You know, you see all kinds of propaganda for, oh, you know, the valiant cancer fighters, and it just pulls at your heartstrings, wants you to give them more money, for goodness sakes. Who wouldn't want to give that kid more money? And then, of course, we take a glimpse behind the scenes into all this high-tech stuff in the cancer treatment centers, and we go, oh, my God, these people must know what they're doing. It's because we put the medical doctors on a pedestal. We have. And I wrote a lot about that in my book, about how that happened, why that happened. But we've been socialized to think that if the MDs can't figure it out, nobody can. So even when they fail us, even when they harm us, even when they bankrupt us, even when they kill us, we give them a pass and we write another check. You've got to be kidding me. My people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. We rattle our chemo pill bottles to celebrate our health. And it's just not right. Let's talk about chemotherapy. Here's a brief history of chemotherapy. You put that heavy thing on your head because it's going to explode. Chemotherapy was developed because of things that they saw happening in World War II in Barry, Italy with mustard gas. Soldiers exposed to mustard gas had reduced white blood cell counts. So these two guys, Goodman and Gilman from Yale, used it, used chemotherapy to treat leukemia, which is white cell, white blood cell cancer. Wow. Apparently, though, it didn't work too well. Because here's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma deaths, 2016, that was 1942, so that's 58 plus 16. So that's 74 years later. Sorry, not working so well. 72,580 new cases every year, and a third of those people die every year. Oh, but that's what we developed chemotherapy for 76 years ago. But uh, what? By the way, let's not even think or talk about for a minute, for a minute survivorship. Let's not even talk about survivorship. How about cancer incidents? Nobody talks about that. Cancer incidents is still pretty high while we've given the MDs complete, utter, and total control over the development and the delivery of medicine. Now, chemotherapy that doesn't work is r r rampant with nasty side effects. Prevalence of long-term consequences of, can of chemotherapy. Um, this I downloaded from the National Cancer Survivorship Initiative. At least 500,000 people, and this was a United Kingdom website. Half a million people in the UK are facing poor health or disability after treatment for cancer. Treatment for cancer that doesn't work. At least 350,000 people living with and beyond cancer are experiencing chronic fatigue. 350,000 having sexual difficulties. 240,000 living with mental health problems. 200,000 living with moderate to severe pain. 150,000 are affected by urinary problems such as incontinence, but you know, what the heck? 98% of them after five years died. I mean, yeah, they died. But before they died, they had all this nonsense going on with them, and we put up with it. I mean, all you have to do is follow the money. Did you know did you know? This from the New York Times. It is a unique situation in medicine. Unlike other kinds of doctors, cancer doctors are allowed to profit from the sale of chemotherapy drugs. So here's how it goes, right? If you have heartburn and you're prescribed Prilosec, the prescribing physician has no skin in that game. You go to the pharmacy, you buy it, and the doctor gets nothing. Now, if the doctor makes, you know, 
10,000 Prilosec prescriptions in a year, he's probably going to get a free trip to Las Vegas for a medical conference, right? But there's no quid pro quo. There's no direct money exchanged, right? No percentage, but not with chemo. So the hospital or the hospital buys it. I'm making up numbers here. Pretty good guesstimate though. Buys it for $2,000, the chemotherapy drug. They sell it to the patient for $12,000. That's a $10,000 profit. The hospital and the oncologist split it. Now, why on earth would a medical therapeutic that produced unbelievably poor results and remarkably high side effects continue to be rolled out? Follow the money, baby. It's pretty easy when you look at it. National expenditures for cancer care projected to increase 27% between 2010 and 2020. Well, it's good for the oncologist, not so good for you. And, you know, they total cancer expenditure, right? That's how they, that's how they promote this and how they talk about it. Total cancer expenditure. What they should say is total profits by the cancer industry. I mean, it, it's coming out of somebody's pocket. It's going into somebody's pocket. It's going into the oncologist's pocket, but that's not what they say. They don't say total cancer profits by oncologists expected to go up by 27% in the next 10 years. They don't say that. It's another way you've been manipulated. Now here's what started it all. This study published in 2004. Here's what these guys did. This was an Australian study. They looked at, they collected metadata from thousands of patients in Australia who had developed cancer and were treated. Many different therapies, including chemotherapy. They did a statistical analysis of all of it. Objective statistical analysis. This wasn't research that was funded by the pharmaceutical industry. And here's what they concluded. The overall contribution of curative and adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy to five-year survival in adults was estimated to be between 2.3% in Australia and 2.1% in the USA. Now remember, this is just five-year survivorship. And what we talked about before, this isn't a cancer cure. This is what can you expect if you have cancer and you get chemo, regardless of what type of cancer you have. It's a little bit different for all the different types of cancer, but if you average them all together, these are the numbers. Conclusion. Published. As the five-year relative survival rate for cancer, remember it's relative survival rate, not absolute. Relative. Most people wouldn't understand what that means. Now you understand what it means. For cancer in Australia is now over 60%, it is clear that cytotoxic chemotherapy only makes a minor contribution to cancer survival. To justify the continued funding and availability of drugs used in cytotoxic chemotherapy, a rigorous evaluation of the cost effectiveness and the impact on the quality of life is urgently required. This happened 13 years ago this December and Nobody in the U.S. has picked it up except me. It's like whispering into a hurricane. So, the simple fact of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, is that you've been played. And it's time we all collectively snapped out of it. Let's put it in perspective. Your medical doctor may be the nicest person God ever created, but your medical doctor doesn't practice medicine. They practice allopathic medicine. Allopathic medicine, based on reductionism, is by its nature oppositionally defiant. That's how the drugs got their name. Antibiotic, antidepressant, antihistamine, uh, uh, antacid, right? Uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, proton pump inhibitor. The medicines are oppositionally defiant. Allopathic medicine attempts, when somebody is sick, to deliver a medicine which orchestrates a violent takeover of the human body. 
it opposes the disease process at all costs. So when an allopath deals with cancer, they try to develop a treatment that kills the tumor, right? Surgically remove it, burn it with radiation, or dissolve it with chemotherapy. Kill the tumor, kill it, kill it, kill it. Crush, kill, destroy, right? This is their whole thing. But the tumor is not the disease. It's the result of the disease. I mean, even if you kill the tumor, even if you remove the tumor, even if you shrink the tumor or burn the tumor or eliminate the tumor, guess what? Comes back. He's back. Because the oppositionally defiant medicine did not get to the root cause of the disease. This is just breast cancer recurrence. Here's the five-year mark. What's this? 89% survivorship of breast cancer? What are you talking about? After five years, it's getting worse. I mean, why do you think they chose the five-year mark? Because the results, relatively speaking, again, not absolutely, relatively speaking, not that bad. Relatively. To everybody else in the population who's alive or dead who's the same age. But after five years, it's all over. And why would you even... How do they even sleep at night selling cancer treatment like this? Because they know it doesn't cure cancer. There's like one type of childhood le leukemia, I believe, that has really pretty good results with conventional therapy. And again, it's too early to tell. We don't know what's going to happen to those kids in 30 years from now. And that's a big problem with chemotherapy. Let's review. We haven't had a free medical market since the early 1900s in the United States. The only branch of medicine that cancer research and treatment dollars goes to is the MDs. The MDs don't practice medicine, they practice allopathic medicine. Allopathic treatment of cancer delivers statistically horrible results with horrible side effects at a huge profit to the industry. But these Treatments are pitched to you in such a way as to make them seem much more effective than they in point of fact really are. According to Webster's Dictionary, quackery is the promotion of fraudulent or ignorant medical practices. I am of the opinion that your oncologist is practicing quack medicine. I said it out loud and I'm standing by it. Caveat emptor, ladies and gentlemen. Ten questions that every cancer patient should ask their oncologist in the presence of a witness and a recording device. You ready? Doctor, what causes my cancer? Oh, it's genetic. It's genetic. Which gene is it and on which chromosome? Will your treatment cure my cancer? There's the million dollar question. If it's not going to cure it, what can I expect it to do? And what will the side effects of your treatment be? How are you going to treat the side effects? Can the treatment itself give me cancer? Well, that's a good question. What percentage of the time is your treatment going to give me cancer? What are we nuts? How much money will you make from my treatment? You personally, how much money will you personally profit from my treatment? How much? I want to know. I'm shopping. I don't know whether to go here, whether to go to Sloan Kettering. I don't know whether to go to Rush in Chicago. I don't know where to go. Maybe I should go to Tufts. What are you going to profit? I need to know. How much is the hospital going to profit? I need to know. Freedom of Information Act, baby. And lastly, I need the names of five of your cancer patients who've had this type of cancer that you've treated for more than five years or that are still alive after five years. I want five of their names. I want to call them up and see how they're doing. Now, I've had patients kicked out of their oncologist's office because they asked these questions. And that's just not right. It shouldn't be like that. But that's the way that it is. In the not-so-wonderful world of MD-directed, Machiavellian, monopolistic, 
medicine in the unfree medical marketplace of the 21st century. And oh, by the way, it gets worse because it's not just like this with cancer. Here's an overview of what's happened to us while we have given the MDs unfettered, unbridled control over the development and delivery of medicine. It's time to wake up.
Thanks for your time, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you learned something. If And this is really just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. If you want to educate yourself about more of these subjects, things that you can do to actually get into the game of healing, then please visit my website, glidden.healthcare, uh, and learn as much as you possibly can. The problem that we have in the 21st century is that because it's illegal for anybody but the MDs to treat cancer, or licensed naturopathic doctors in certain states can treat cancer, but we don't have near the research money or the resources that the conventional medical doctors have. And as far as I'm aware, there's like one clinic in Texas, the Brzezinski Clinic, <clears throat> that does anything that even comes close to being an effective cancer treatment center. We need funded holistic cancer treatment centers, but they don't exist. So we don't have, I'm not aware of any reliable cancer treatments. I would recommend that you talk to Dr. Brzezinski in Texas. But we do have very effective treatments for most of the things that most people go to the doctor for most of the time, and I have information about that on my website. It's a sad state of affairs. Perhaps if there's enough noise, if there's enough public outcry, then we will just stop giving money to the medical doctors and maybe some Saudi prince will donate a billion dollars for a legitimate holistic cancer treatment center and then we can see what we can see. I am your steadfast advocate for health, Dr. Peter Glidden. Thanks for your time and your trust. I'll see you around campus.